farmers are losing any more sleep over the thought of you know, how resilient are their operations without this money. And I'm thinking of, um, I'm sure I read somewhere a few decades ago, that New Zealand sheep farmers um, were threatened with a loss of various subsidies and, well, it's going to be the collapse of the industry, but um, I'm sure I read that they managed to adapt and, and survive. Good question, Andy. Do you want to pick up on that one to start off with? I travelled to New Zealand the year after they had the subsidies taken away, so yeah, good comment. Um, in the pure of my heart, I would like all subsidies taken away because those who are then farming are doing it because they want to farm. They're probably the most efficient. I don't know how I'd fare in that system because I, if there are rules, you've got to play the rules. If there's subsidy payments, you play that game because that's the system you're set in. If it's taken away, I'd hopefully play the best productive system I could within the economic and the environmental factor I'm within. I think governments have to maintain some sort of control over food production because the people sat in front of us probably only 2% are producing food. Where are you going to get your food from? So the government have to know that there is a, a food supply there. But from a farmer, it is a very confusing method. They go about doing it and it seems to be a very uh, bureaucratic um, beast that is very unworldly and very slow to adapt to actually what farmers can do. But then again, I think governments are a little bit concerned about farmers because they're possibly the, one of the last industries that can get off, go off in different directions so quickly and adapt to a rule. And um, farmers aren't subversive, but they certainly find a way around a rule pretty quick if there is a gap. Um, but there's a lot of right thinkers. You've got to be on a farm and you've got to be fairly diverse and think fairly quick on your feet. A very tricky subject. If they took it away, there'd be a lot of keen farmers out there, but there could be a food shortage within two years because nobody wants to do that job. Andy, thank you. Michael, did you like to comment on that? I think it's on that, actually. The grant the, um, the that I get from the EC of, of, of the single farm payment is that equal to the tax that I pay. So I wouldn't pay any tax, presumably. So I wouldn't be any worse off. <laughs> well, how's that sound? <laughs> All right. It's about the same. Yeah, that's the fact, though. I think that's probably typical of many farming businesses, actually. I wouldn't miss it, actually. Yeah. You'd end up still paying that's... some of the tax, wouldn't you? What? You'd still end up paying some of the tax. Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know what the bottom line is, but that, um, no, I'm getting 50000 a year at the moment, which is a lot of money, from the single part payment. And but the farm pays £50,000 income tax. So, I mean, that's not, so we get 50000 less. Uh, then I pay 50,000 less tax than I'm done. You are employing civil servants as well, aren't you? I speak the accountant about it. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds to me like the one equals the other. That's why we wouldn't be any worse off, would If I? you had a really bad year, though, then you'd still get the payment in. You wouldn't pay the tax. Yeah, yeah, and, um, and if you lost the payment in... I think positive. <laughs> Okay. Tax, 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 <laughs> I don't just go towards the single farm table. No, that's right. There's okay. some really good questions coming out of this debate that could take up a long, long time. We could be sat here all day debating it, but for the, for, for the purposes of this session, we'll move on. So good question, though. Very good question. Yeah. Gentleman with the hat, then um, in the front row, man with the mic after. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, sorry if I'm changing the subject here, but I've got a question for Michael as a dairy farmer. Um, I come from Devon and um, a lot of dairy farming goes on there and we appear to be faced with the prospect of uh, another round of uh, badger culling which uh, apparently uh, is against uh, the government's own scientific advice anyway um, and uh, apparently on this occasion it's likely to be um, uh, achieved by um, farmers themselves possibly using guns in the countryside in ways um, that uh, seemed to me a bit alarming, and I just wonder, as a, as a dairy farmer, can you give us a, a perspective on the uh, issue of budget coming? Yeah, we do have a problem with TB at the moment, you know that, don't you? Uh, and and uh, we're out losing a lot of cows uh, um, around the country as a whole, I mean. Uh, and, uh, and, um, but there's a debate about the budget connection. Um, you. But the people here are probably going to a horrible thing if you have parties, probably. Would you not? Only unnecessarily. But yeah, but I, I mean, uh, but as a dairy farmer, I, 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 um, 
my cows that, that, that's more important to me than badgers, I have to tell you that. And, 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 and so when I'm losing cows, uh, then I'd rather see the badgers go. But, but, um, but the debate is ongoing. The, the government scientists, or the chief veterinary officer, can't make his mind up at the moment. Uh, and the Welsh experiment's looking like it's working at the moment. I'm in favour of the cow versus the badger. So I think it's likely to tip, the whole argument is likely to tip in favour of the cow, but rather than the badger, I think, it's long term. But I'm doing a bit of a Judas at the moment. I'm to put my hand up. I don't really know which way it's going to go. and I, I, I'm, I'm waiting for the evidence, really, <laughs> to prove that, um, oh, first I'm on the side of the cow trade, because that's what I do, that's what I've done for and my family doing it for over 100 years, you know, right? And, and, and so if there is proof, that then the badger population would have to be reduced, I think. Thank you, Michael. Um, Nick, can I just put in there a yeah, minute? What I would say on that part, part, we're shut down with TB at the moment. We've had um, one inconclusive. What, as a, a country person and someone who likes living animals, I like to see healthy animals, and I don't like to see a huge waste of money on killing animals that might have TB. And I don't think the badger should be neglected from its fate of dying of TB. There's a huge question within that, how you get about it, but there shouldn't be ill animals when they've been trying to sort out TB for how many years? Since 1953, I believe. Um, I was just going to, just go, oh, I'll concur with what Andy just said, because we're in a similar situation, actually. I think it's a misnomer, really. We don't want, if it's going to, any action is going to be taken against badgers to control badgers. It shouldn't necessarily be called a badger cull because that's not what it's all about. Cull means to do away with. I think what we're looking to do, or the industry is looking to do, is control disease wildlife. And you ask any farmer, they don't want to see the end of any species. They would like to see a healthy population. And I think that's the context in which it needs to be taken, is that we want to control the wildlife disease. And if there's disease in wildlife, we need to control that. If it's disease in cows, we need to control that as well. And if we've got TB in cows, if it's the best way to get rid of it, is to kill the animals, then so be it. Likewise, if it's the best way to get rid of diseased wildlife, whether it's badger or deer or birds or whatever else, if that's the best way, they need to be got away with as well. So it needs to have a balanced perspective rather than thinking about culling everything. Right? So that was just to qualify it. Go on, Did is there, is there not another way? You can use vaccine. Well, there is there is a potential vaccine that could be used, um, but the one thing against that is the minute we use a vaccine to vaccinate an animal, a bovine animal, it stops us being us being the UK being able to or the country it's been used in to export any bovine products. So it, as soon as we start doing that, you can't export anything out of, out of the country. And if you look at all, sorry. Absolutely, that's one of the things, but all of a sudden you're left with lots and lots of bits and pieces that people don't want to be buying. And if you're looking at, say, just for an example of a four-quarter of a beast, so a bovine beast, beef animal, all of a sudden everybody will be buying the back ends of it, like they do. We'll have lots and lots of front ends to get rid of. And that's the sort of thing, I guess, the story, that's the sort of thing you're coming up against, this carcass balancing, which, in a simplistic view... It's great, and we would love to be able to do that. But as an industry in a country, if we're supplying what people want, which is the pine quarters of lots of things, at the end of the day, we've got lots of four quarters. And things that we can't or we don't use in this country, for example, um, the fifth quarter of a pig. You know, people don't eat offal in this country very much like they used to. All of that goes for export. Well, I'm not saying suggesting that the pig industry will suffer as a consequence from vaccinating cows. But the example is, if we couldn't export that fifth quarter, all of a sudden we would have to get rid of it without eating it in this country. And that's the sort of the bigger, the bigger argument that takes part in it. And again, we're coming back to a situation where it's a big, big discussion to be had about this, and rather than just a sort of a short five minutes. Now. But I take your point. Late in the front end. Hi. Um, I've been using sound and frequency as a modality for healing and, and various things for a number of years and studying the effects of it. And I must admit, when Michael was talking about the highest yield in cows, I wonder if it's because of all the music, that, the frequency that they're, they're getting on a regular basis. And I wonder, first of all, if, if you'd consider doing that with your 
animals. But also, um, most people have no idea how powerful frequency is. And um, it might be something that you can look at for eradicating some of the, the problems that you've got and increasing growth in, in plants and vegetation. I mean, I know, for example, someone who um, is a world expert on frequency, and I've been studying with her. And the frequency, for example, of dragonfly knocks out the problem of mosquito. And all diseases have a particular frequency. All medication has a frequency. So the theory is, instead of having to give a medication or a pesticide or something, you actually give the sound frequency and you get a better result without the effects. That's a good question. I think we'll hand that one to my question. <laughs> can, can, can we import you two onto our farm, please? Because with their vocal range, I don't know. Is anybody, you know, do you want to pick up on any of that, seriously? I think there's a lot of uh, technologies, a lot of knowledge out there that is definitely not mainstream, that should be looked into. Um, a lot of the uh, taken for granted medical treatment now, prior to it coming mainstream, was looked at with a lot of scepticism. Um, maybe this is the kind of thing that we've, as a group, as a body, the national farmers, the teachers, whoever, have got to go back to government and go, there's another way, there are other ways. We've got to look at that. But we all know how much money goes into research nowadays. It's all taken away. All the research farms in the country have nearly all been sold off. Um, the education system, I would say, is another. It's all down one avenue. Um, so, yeah, we need to look at lots of different ideas. Hence why we are all here today looking at and talking about it, not just going, no, that's a radical idea. We don't want to hear about that. There's a lot of ideas we've got to take on board. We've got to listen to. They mightn't be applicable, or we might have to change the system to allow them to come in. But it sounds a brilliant idea. Um, I don't know what my sheep would like, but they certainly have enough problems that they need. A variation of music would be good, yeah. Thank you. And thank you for the point that's very well made. The lady on the end of the front row? On, on the way, I was just going to mention, I was listening to Radio 4, and um, there's some students in the university up north have done a survey on whether cows that had a name produced more milk and they had, a, they had an expert farmer who said well I don't believe it and my vet doesn't believe it and he's one of the best vets in the country but they do like a bit of house music it keep them, <laughs> keeps them happy um, Given the perfect storm that the chief scientist John Bennington says we're facing with climate change you know, water scarcity, fuel prices all the rest of it um, do you think Britain could feed itself? And if so, should we? Right, I think everybody can play a part in that, but I think probably, to start off with, John, you'd probably be as good to kick that one off. Um, huge question. Um, I'm not sure I'm well qualified to, uh, to, to be an answer for that. I mean, all I can talk about is what we're trying to do locally. Um, <coughs> I think, uh, go back to the comment I made earlier on the pattern of land use, for example, around Somerset, is we are going to struggle, for example, on things like fruit and veg at the moment, unless there is a really critical look at how we use our land and what we use it for. Um, if you're then reliant, even in the southwest of England, on large fuel inputs in moving fruit and veg about the country, I mean, round here, I think, on dairy and meat, we probably could be quite self-sufficient locally. Um, I'm not sure what the answer is to that. We, I mean, we, we've kind of looked at our piece of land, only 50 acres, and reckoned that we could probably feed 1,000 families. Now, how many more farms there are like that that could be used in that way, I don't really have the answers. It's quite, I'm, you can't fail to be a little bit pessimistic about it, um, because there, there is not enough arable horticultural land around in the southwest. It's just it's a fact. Um, Thank you, John Michael. I don't think the hope and health charts are actually because we that the the population is increasing at such a rate in this country that there's uh, uh, um, we only do about half the needs of the nation is is provided by this country. But so so unless you um some move people abroad or something. 
Uh, 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 population is rising as well. vastly reduced population. Yeah, it is. I mean, yeah. India, for instance. Yeah. Uh, so, no, I don't think there's a whole bit of health chance of that happening. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Can I say something as well? Um, I think one of the questions is whether you can feed consumers what consumers want. And I think one of the big problems is that when you offer healthy food to people, they often don't recognise it because they're, the mass of the population out there has all been trained to eat processed food that has particular attributes, more sugar, more salt, whatever it is. And although you get policy steers from government to reduce sugar, to reduce processing, do what you like, you still find that the things that shift off the shelves are the unhealthy foods as a whole. And I think it's, uh, you know, the ability for the countryside to feed itself is one thing, but you also have to train consumers about what they should be eating to help say, solve that problem, to square that circle. Um, just to just develop in that, how would you suggest that that education takes place? How do you train people? Well, you stop, you stop promoting the rubbish to start. Well, I think, they have I actually, I'm teaching, they have actually last year handed out to each child a fork with lovely, nice uh, recipes and this and that. But the problem is, they haven't actually given the parents or the children a chance to go through this recipe book together. So they've wasted lots of money giving out these books, but they've not actually done anything with them. So any instructions. Okay, when you say they, is this the government or food staff? The government. Okay. All right, um, so from that perspective, how would you, you know, how would you, if you were given a role of assisting the government, what would you do? Thank you. Go on, and John. Just, uh, just picking. Well, it, it, it's back to two points Andy made earlier. One about food waste, and one about um, actually getting people reconnected with where their food comes from. I mean, we sell veg boxes, for example, to people I would view as fairly educated consumers. If they're buying a local organic veg box um, from a small producer who complain, for example, if their carrots are dirty. And God forbid if you would put anything in there that might have a little bit of carrot root fly on it that you could peel off. We could increase our sales by 25-30% if people would buy those from us. As it is, they go to compost or they go to pigs. Um, now, people start to change their mind when you get them out and show them farming and how it works and actually get them out digging and weeding and explain to them how hard it is to keep a disease like carrot uh, pests like carrot root fly off from a carrot by organic methods without using pesticides. And gradually they start, they take a little bit more ownership and you increase their knowledge. And people start to realise that good food doesn't have to be cosmetically perfect, which is a huge part of the food waste problem that we have. Um, that I think there's another factor in the, the equation about being able to feed ourselves as a nation or, or even locally. In that certainly in Devon, I see lots of potentially productive agricultural land that isn't being used in a productive way. Um, and I'm not sure whether we have to start putting pony on the menu um, or whether there's some kind of taxation um, issue here. Um, but it, it seems to me that that's also tied in with access to land. That um, often if a farm is broken up and sowed off, it's often the, the pony people um, who, can, who can bid more than sort of other people who want to sort of take on the types of projects that we've been hearing about. And I, I, I just wonder if there is, a, there, I'm quite sure there is a solution, but I don't think the politicians will grasp it. It's a point, it's a point well made. Does anybody like to make any comment about that? Eating ponies. <laughs> it's in the quiet, it's in the it's quiet. It's <laughs> Go well, squirrel. I'd, I'd like to, what I'd like to say, um, I see the supermarkets as having a massive impact on the way that the relationship between consumers, uh, the buying and selling of food, and the whole market has had and has, has really changed the whole landscape of farming because they're basically dictating what they want to buy from the farmer, what price they want to buy it from, and, uh, 
And if, if you don't like it, they'll just cut the cut the, the contract, the relationship. And that a, a lot of a lot of smaller farmers, I think, have gone out of business. Perhaps in I think probably in, very much in America, but also very much over here because of that. And I, I just wondered how that could be addressed and how smaller farmers could work more closely together to prevent that from happening and prevent farms, you know, sort of businesses going out of business and, you know, sort of being swallowed up by larger businesses which are controlled by, you know, Sigmar or even owned by them. Okay. I just wonder where the way forward is, really. That's a really good point. Out of interest, are you a farmer yourself? I'm not. I'm, I'm looking at community... I'm very much in uh, community-supported agriculture and involved, you know, sort of the church farm, okay. um, you know, sort of on a you know peripheral end, but yeah. very much I want to get more involved. Okay, brilliant. So does anybody like to address that on a voluntary basis before I ask you? Uh, there's the records we got of this farm. Uh, 1770 it was built. There's about 300 acres now. It's now about 160 acres. There's been about 20 people regularly employed on the farm. It's the uh, kind of mechanical, technical step-ons which we've had in the agriculture industry that has replaced human labour. Um, I can see possibly a lot of that coming back in. There are the jobs that can be done. And as we mentioned about maybe an increase in the red fuel, um, being more off-grid by using human resource, maybe a government swing in where people can live, things like that could possibly change. <laughs> It's a very awkward one to say that there is a everybody should have half an acre of land to produce, to be able to produce, produce their food on, which would probably then take us back to a project that we're linked into on the farm with Send a Cow and Grow It Global, which was introduced into Uganda, where each farmer was or the poorest farmer was taken, given a cow or given a sheep or given an animal which is applicable to their area and their style of farming. They were taught how to compost, they were taught how to grow vegetables throughout the season, uh, better water usage, and now they as individuals are far more productive, they have surplus crop to sell, so they can trade with their neighbours to give product to their neighbours to help them out. And it's that community spirit which, working as a community, you can share, I want to produce potatoes, you want to produce peas, you want to keep a few chickens. Farming has been driven away from that community base with the technolo technological and economic drive that you have to be, you have to consolidate in the business you are. As a dairy farmer, you've got to focus in on that. You can't be anything else because you'll be inefficient. Um, but I think from what we're trying to do as a lot of farmers, we work with a lot of other farmers around here. We graze their sheep on their land. So there is getting a lot more interaction it is slowly coming back into the farming community that little farms can exist next to big farms because there is a balance that can be played amongst those farmers. Community farms will find gaps on bigger farms where they have 20 acres down the road that they don't want to chase their tractor down to there to take a 20 foot or 30 foot combine into harvest one field. There are going to be a lot more opportunities and the way things are changing, I'm sure these are going to come on board fairly quick. So I think it's everybody's got to lift their heads up and say the projects they want to get involved in and people will partnership you. It's being proud of what you're doing a lot of the time though. I think really in a nutshell, it, it boils down to, what well, Candice said, it's cooperation, not necessarily a cooperative, but cooperation and collaboration. And so, you know, it might be that you've got a 25 acre farm that in all, all intents and purposes would be difficult to make a living off of, off of that for a family if you're working with other people and drawing other people's expertise in and exchanging that expertise, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to. Mm. Right, thank you. Yeah. I, I would just to come on from that, also a second add-on really, because I think it's madness the fact that we import things like mange too and uh, vegetables from, yeah. you know, and I just wondered what the panel might think, how we can actually change that around and really, you know, what we need to, how we need to change our the, the, you know the way maybe whether it's a local tax that you know it's a sort of a tariff or, or what have you you know so that I know it's supply and demand yeah. um, but it's obviously it's madness really you know and it's we can open that one up as well but certainly from the point of view your examples you're making about Monge 2 from Peru and I don't know cut flowers from South Africa and whatever you know, 
chili and strawberries in the middle of winter. It's, as farmers and growers, and as a nation, and the young lady picked up on it just now about education, we've probably done our, the industry has done ourselves a disservice by losing that connection with the consumer. So whereas 30 or 40 years ago, you wouldn't expect to have Monge 2 if they're, you know, if we were looking at those sort of things in the middle of winter then. If you're having that, it would be in June and July because that was the season. Likewise, if you had Swedes or parsnips, it would be late, with, you know, late into the year or into the uh, winter after Christmas when you're having that. You wouldn't have it in the middle of June from a supermarket shelf. So there's that distinct um, dissociation now from actually the seasons. If people just have what they want all year round, I think it would be difficult, well, it would be simple to impose a tax, whether that's the right way to do it. Um, I don't know, but certainly education will play a big part in getting seasonality back into our diet. Um, and things like, you know, the um, um, global global warming from shipping stuff from South America over to you to get monitored to the really winter, if that's the example, you know, that could be minimised by not actually doing it. But it comes back to people need to understand seasonality. They need to understand about their diets that we were talking about just now. Um, and actually understanding how to, how to construct meals from what's available rather than deciding, oh, well, we'll have that tonight and just go to the supermarket and buy it. Right. <laughs> so, man with the mic, you had a question. Yeah, well, there, there, was, there was a couple of things. Firstly, I thought I would just mention Linda um, sat at the front that has been working on a program called uh, Food, Ma uh, Food Mapper, wasn't it? And um, which is a map of all of the people growing uh, on any scale local food across the southwest, which I think is a really good um, network and certainly if, if uh, I'd be going there straight away if, if there was another oil crisis I'd be straight onto the website, right, who's got the spinach, please. Because that, I mean that's the ultimate, if, if we did run out of oil um, or if there was, a, as if there was a break in the oil, I think it's three days and at this point um, we need to know where the local food is being produced, I think it's just a really good scheme to be aware of. Um, I just wanted to ask Andy, um, in terms of uh, your overall income, um, I, I, I see you, you've got events running on your site and you're selling your produce direct to the, to the, to the customer on site. Do you, do, how do you find that in, inputs into your income stream? Is it, is, it a really, is it a useful contribution as a model? It is increasing. Mm -hmm. um, a simple example, take a lamb to the marketplace, Central Market, for instance, the lamb that we ate on the barbecue last night, that lamb would have made about £75 a market. You turn that lamb with the aid of a baker and someone picking a few lettuce leaves from the garden into a, a lamb in a bat, and you can turn that £75 lamb into about £350. Obviously there's a chef, there's a person picking the vegetables, there's a butcher, there's slaughtering fees. Yes, it has a huge impact, but that's one lamb for approximately 500 people who ate last night, um, we need to do that. We produce about a thousand lambs, so we've got a lot more events to organise yet. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and by the way, the breakfast, I, 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 I winced at the price, but once I'd eaten it, I'd forgotten about the price because it was the best breakfast I've had for, I think, about a year. <laughs> 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 Uh, yes, you, you think you've got a problem here with uh, ponies. You, you stole my question. Thanks very much. Delighted. Um, I, think, I think it's time for a campaign on this because in the southeast of England, we simply can't get land that's close to the town because the, the uh, recreational pony people have got all of it. We have, we have one field of buy um, and, and one flock of sheep close to farm town centre, and that's it. But everything else is, is horses. And they're not doing anything other than being ridden around, around the countryside. There's a figure being banded around over the last couple of years. There's more horses and ponies in the UK now than there were before the First World War. Which, I don't know the actual, actual number, that's what I heard quoted, and I, I, I believe it's about right, but you just take a look around for yourself, so I think it's probably true. And as you say, they're eating off of fairly productive grain, producing something useful for the roses and that's about it. Has anyone, has anyone thought of a campaign about this? Because you, it could be taxed. It's not agricultural land anymore. It's the point, but it comes back to the, you know, the ability to tax it. We're living in a country 
debt, there's a supply and demand culture, there's a freedom of choice. Now you could tax it, but it comes back to taxing you know, imported food. It's a dangerous thing to start getting involved with, I think, personally. When you're actually talking about supply and demand, the supply, i.e. ground for ponies, and the demand, there's a demand there, so people are prepared to pay for it. Now if you're actually looking at producing food off of that land, which we as a panel do, we as an industry do, we need to be certain that if we're either buying that land or renting the land, that we're going to get the return on our investment for actually planting food in there. For example, if somebody's prepared to pay £200 an acre for a horse paddock, which to keep their horse on, when I say £200, £200 a year for rent, £200 for somebody who's looking after their pet horse or their horse that they use for um, pleasure purposes is nothing, it's small change. Likewise, to buy a bale of hay for it, if they need to spend five pounds for a bale of hay because it's really, really good meadow hay, no dust, no seeds, no nothing else, it's pocket money out of their pocket. If we're producing food off of it, I don't know, producing lamb, Andy wouldn't go out and pay two hundred pounds an acre rent for an acre for an acre of land to produce lamb off because it's not economically viable. We wouldn't to produce beef off of or milk off of. We certainly wouldn't pay two hundred pounds an acre to produce wheat off of. So that is where we're actually, but thank you very much. That's where we're actually coming from as an industry. So it is very much about supply and demand. And if you take, I, I agree. But where we are, people are actually buying the land to keep the horses. They're well, not paying farmers. Okay, well, no, but they're taking land away and paying extraordinary amounts of money to buy that land. That farmers, economically, if you're looking at a return on your investment, we will not get a return on it. At the end of the day, if we bought land, you would look at long-term growth rather than a return on it this year, next year, or in 10 years, if you're measuring that depreciation over that. To them, to buy an acre of land, and I don't know how much they're buying it for, but if it's £8,000, a lot of people, £8,000 for an acre of land, or fifteen or £20,000, in more 20,000. 20, but to a lot of people, that's not an enormous amount of money, in the greatest respect. If we had to go out and buy land at 20,000 pounds to keep cows on it, we wouldn't do it. You know, we'd give up keeping. Michael, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't go out and buy land at 20,000 pounds to put cows on. He might for a festival, <laughs> but not for cows. And that's the sort of thing that we're looking at. So it's, a, it's, it's quite a complex argument. And the thing that would lead on from that is if you're actually talking about food production, Tell me the last time anybody went in a supermarket and saw an empty shelf. It doesn't happen. We're not hungry. As a nation, we're not hungry. You're right. You know, there's some people that don't have enough food, unfortunately. But our social conscience, our social structure, means that we don't go hungry. Go to the supermarket and the shelves were empty and people were crying out for food. All of a sudden, you'd be saying, we don't want the horses in that paddock, we want food being group. We want the story group in there producing food, or we want Michael Evis producing milk, or Andy producing lamb. That's the argument. At the moment, we're not a hungry nation. And until we're hungry, we won't be able to get rid of horses in paddocks, if indeed that's what we need to do. Okay. Question at the back. Um, what do you see? Uh, there's, a microphone. I think there's a microphone coming to you. Oh, right. <coughs> Uh, yeah. um, what would you see as the farmer's role if we were to suffer severe economic hardship, i.e. a Great Depression, whereby things like uh, food from abroad no longer became a, a viable option simply because the world became, dare I say, fairer? What do you see the role as the farmer and how do you see that evolving? That is a really good question and I think we've probably all got something to say to that. But I'll just, I'll kick it off. I see agriculture, I think, from Professor, the chap who did the private, the perfect storm. He's outlined what the global um, situation is going to be over the next 40 years. We've got a population of 6 billion at the moment, anticipated to rise to 9 billion. We've got a land mass, we can't make any more land. And that's why the prices in East Anglia or wherever it is have gone up to £20,000 because you can't make land. We've got a finite amount of water that we actually can use and recycle and reuse all the time. Agriculture, specifically this country I'm talking about to start off with, we will be the saviours of the population for the next 40 years because we're the ones that control the land and can make good use of the water and actually produce food to feed people. And I think that people need to realise that that's a global issue. It's not just about this country, it's about feeding the world. And that's, it's a great big thing to say. 
But we as farmers, we have a moral duty to actually do that. We need to feed everybody in the world. So from the point of view of you know, the depression, the economic climate you're talking about, farmers need to be able to do that, but we need to be put in a position where it's viable to actually do it. And I'm not saying about raping and pillaging everybody and making huge, huge profits. It's about fair and equitable returns on what we're actually doing. If we're in a position we can do that and not actually be driven all the time on price, 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 the industry will be prepared to be able to do it, and they will be able to do it. But that, in a nutshell, is where we're at at the minute. I'll pass it over to the panel. Uh, a great problem at the moment with a lot of agriculture and a lot of industries all through is the red tape. The people who come around and want to see documentation for this, that and the other, make sure you put the correct date, the correct holding number on when you've moved a group of sheep from one farm to another. They've got the records, they've got the photocopy of it, and they still someone out, send someone out to come and check that you've done the correct paperwork, taking up time. All of it needs to be done, but not the method they're using at the moment. There's majority of farmers who are farming that want to farm, want to be more as productive within the environmental confines as they can be. Um, and I'd like to say farmers are up for the challenge if more food needs to be produced. As long as the consumers a little bit understand them, that you're not going to have your strawberries in for Christmas dinner, and you're not going to have sweet growing through your summer months for your salad crop. A lot more understanding, a lot more communication, um, and I'm sure it could happen. But it would need a lot of people on board with it as well, with a lot of understanding. Can I just add to that and say, well, the, the next logical step would be, how do you feel about then people coming to live on your land? Uh, you're talking about people who Actually, effectively need to. Happen. I think when the whole thing collapses, you know, the imports and the industry and, uh, and the oil and the energy, uh, 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 then there'll be a struggle back to the land, won't there? Yeah. As there was in the Middle Ages. But at the moment, I mean, we're offering a lot of people, and people don't even take the land for free, you know what I mean? Uh, so, because it's going so well at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, so I've got land, I'm offering land in the village now for people to do a lot. I've got 18 and we've got room for about 100. Uh, so they're not really interested in it. Uh, 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 but when push comes to shove, which it will a uh, 100 years time or 200 years time, uh, then everyone will be back on the land again because there'd be no choice, would there? Or there'd be nowhere else to go, would there? How far away is that point, though? Sooner than that. Sooner than that. Sooner than that. <laughs> I wouldn't say so. It might be that's what social housing becomes, where we actually push people to become self-reliant rather than buying. It won't be social houses. I mean, it'll be teepees and yurts and stuff, won't it? Yeah. Right. I mean, it will. It's what's going to happen eventually. I mean, it's bound to, isn't it? Question on the end. more of a. But when? <laughs> There's much more of a point related to something that was said earlier about feeding ourselves locally, you know, we, we eat a hell of a lot of rice and pasta in this country, and I don't know if anybody tries to grow rice at the moment, but I think it would be very hard to grow, grow flour that's strong enough to make pasta, and it's, you know, you talk about strawberries in winter, but these are foods we eat all the year round that are we really import, you know, and it's, it's, it's hard to, to take that out of the mix, and I wonder, they are sort of easy to transport in that they don't go off, and maybe we want to have a little balanced view about what we import and what we don't, rather than just being very absolutist about it, because I really doubt we could immediately just do without rice and pasta as a country at the moment. Can I just add to that list before you respond? Go on, then. Uh, there's also a grand number of people who are celiacs who can't eat wheat, mm -hmm. and that means and there aren't any uh, indigenously grown cereals that they, can, that they can tolerate. So there is a growing problem with cereal intolerant people who need imported <coughs> like, like rice and maize and quinoa and all these things. Okay, good point. Um, if I, weather for the last couple of months is only going to go by, we won't be going into rice next year, I think. But, uh, <laughs> question on the front row again, and then man with the mic at the back. At the back, thank you. I just wanted to go back to your point. Had anyone started a campaign? There's an organisation called Sustain, which is um, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming. There's about 100 organisations. They've just produced a report called Good Planning for Good Food. And the scary thing is that pl food production doesn't specifically appear in planning policy. 
So um, they're urging people to make sure that uh, reserving land for food production close to where people live, whether that's commercial or non-commercial, um, we get that requirement into the local development frameworks and core strategies that the local authorities are developing right now. But as the whole thing with planning is changing, it's going to become more difficult to reserve land for food production. So we, yeah, we're going to have to mount a massive campaign to try and secure that. But I would urge you, check out your um, local development framework where you are. And if food for this, land for this purpose is not in there, lobby you know, everybody and ev everyone you can think of to get it in there. Because it's not going to get in there otherwise. Okay, thank you. Back against the pillar, please. Oh. <coughs> so, sorry, I've been working so I didn't. I might miss some of it. But are you saying that you, the world food situation, you're going to feed the world with milk and organic pigs? Because that's basically what the farming industry seems to be concentrating on. To me, and I know nothing about farming, it seems such a massive waste of land and resources to produce 17 different types of chocolate milk and a few organic pigs on a place like this. I think uh, quite a lot of the problem is meat and the production of dairy. I think if farms were turned over to producing food that people wanted, and I think to say it's, it's consumer-led demand isn't really correct. Consumers are basically told what they're going to have rather than what they want. And also, just another point is, you're saying about you can't afford to import things. A lot of the wheat prices and rice prices and stuff in the world are just kept there by people in Wall Street and other places by just manipulating the system, like oil and stuff. The super tankers out in the sea now, full of oil, they're actually circling the globe just to keep the prices up. And it's the same with rice, wheat, everything. It's artificial. The price of food is artificial so that farmers can make money, Americans can make money. I think it needs to be a conscious decision for people to not want, you know, milk and meat. I think meat is the most inefficient way of producing food known to man, I think. Unless you're a really rich farmer and you just want a organic milk, I reckon. Okay, point, your, your point is taken and the panel can open up. To the to the left of the high vis vessel. Did you want to add something to that comment? I just, I just wonder why, I wonder why uh, we're not going back to growing hemp. Um, hemp is a fabulous crop. Um, I had a friend who was running a hemp farm down on a county farm in Devon who was grossing £5,000 an acre because he was value adding on the farm. And we're not growing hemp, it's a great crop. If you grow barley after hemp, you don't need to add any chemicals to the ground, you just plant the barley and it grows, and it grows so well that the guy who came along to harvest the barley to see what was there bought the standing crop as seed barley. Okay. Okay. Right. But why, why we're not looking to, I agree with what Bernie says, it yeah. seems to be a milk, particularly milk industry, and why we're not growing hemp. Okay, point taken, and that adds to the mix, and I believe that's the point you were going to make as well. Basically, Okay, I can't give you an answer for that, but we can certainly start the answer, the question to the answer that Bern has just raised. Um, who wants to kick off with that no, one? Uh, I don't know, I thought milk was a great food. I, don't know. I mean, I might be wrong, but I thought milk was a great food, and uh, um, uh, there's a shortage of it around... Thank you, this night. Sorry. Yeah, that's the question. Bernie? <laughs> <laughs> Michael's answering your question. I don't know if you want to listen to it. I thought milk was a great food for, for the whole nation, for the whole world. Uh, the Chinese are trying to get their hands on our cheese at the moment because they can't get enough of it. And, and um, we need more milk in this country. Uh, 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 there's a milk shortage at the moment. People want to buy milk everywhere. And um, we're just getting it, we're just trying to get a price to make it um, so cover the cost of producing the milk at the moment. We're not profiting much from it. I mean, in spite of what you say about Wall Street, uh, but they're not involved with, 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 with my farm, you know. Um, we're getting another two pence a leap of hope for the first of October. And so just to make it work financially, you know what I mean? 
And so it's not a massive banking operation. There are no shares of my farm, there are no profits to be sold off, you know what I mean? And what's wrong with that? Huh? There must be a massive overproduction because I used to drive the tay mix and we used to pick up from farms thousands of gallons of milk and then take it and dump it. We were actually paying to take milk. You're just dumping uh, it now. Like I say, how long ago was that? You're not well, dumping milk now. Five years ago. Right, it was a completely different situation yeah. now. We were in oversupply. Europe yeah. was in oversupply, and this country was over in oversupply five years ago. But it's quite a different situation now. Your point you made just now about um, you know the ineffectiveness of producing milk or people wanting protein from meat, that actually is quite a simplistic argument when you look at living off of rice or living off of um, cereals, which is fine if that's what people have wanted, but we're not, we need to take it as fact. We're not going to get people to give up meat, give up milk, and give up whatever else to go back to a cereal-based diet. That's the aspiration of the Indian subcontinent and the Chinese to move away from that, become more westernized in the diet. That movement is actually carrying on. I understand your, the point of it. You can't argue that the Indian subcontinent are trying to be like us. But when you say it doesn't, when you say it doesn't work, what doesn't work? I understand it's a, it may be a broken model; it needs to be fine. But what actually doesn't work? Right, absolutely, and I wouldn't argue with that at all. But the the supermarkets, they're selling eighty percent of what was produced in, from British agriculture in this country. That's you know they're there as well. They're they're a fact. You can influence what the consumers want through education, and maybe the retailer's got a role to play in that. But we, as an industry, have a role to play in that as well. I don't necessarily take what you're saying that the, the retailers are telling people what to have. They influence, but if somebody doesn't want something, they won't buy it. No, if you stop, <coughs> if you stop producing a certain item and produce a better quality item, people will buy it. They will stop producing quality Say, for instance, milk then. If we stop producing milk in this country, what would happen? Who would give up drinking? We're talking about tomorrow morning or uh, an, an evolution where people are educated that they don't need a supermarket shelf with 16 different types of cow's milk on it from... But that's a generational... That's a generational thing, isn't it? We're talking long term then. That's, that's the thing. That's what I'm saying. It's a long term thing and you're saying you just stop milk tomorrow. What would happen? We're not talking about stopping milk tomorrow. We're talking about educating people to a different way of eating right. and providing food. And I think one of that is for people to get away from me. Right, okay. Well, that's your... the third world by producing organic eggs in Somerset. No, and I'm not... So I don't, I don't think any... I don't world think... The world is going to be from the third world country. Right. That's going to be the problem. If I know water, no food. So right from here, where we've got water food, and that's what's happening. The country that migrated, we need to help them build their agriculture up and show them a good standard of not say to them what you need to do to produce a lot of I don't disagree with that one bit, and I think that's part of the part of the exercise that's going on with the, the Ugandan farmers and the, the um, food for life, uh, not food for life. What's it with them? Um, send a cow. Grow it global. Grow it global. It's exactly the sort of thing that's going on. So we move on. Can I pick up on that one? Go on. Then. Um, majority of the protein that's produced um, through meat is wasted. There's a we need to all look at the amount of protein, the amount of carbohydrate, fibre we input into our own bodies every day. And that's got to come from the education of everybody. Um, it'd be an easy question to say, how much do we all need to eat per day for your 60, 70 kilos of your own body weight? And I would be quite happy at challenging you all that you all wouldn't have a clue. You'd have a rough idea, but you probably wouldn't have a clue, really. Do you need two potatoes or three potatoes to gain the energy levels you need? 
we try and farm by comparative advantage, which I think ought to carry on around the world. And I think that's where, when I was taught about the EU and how Russia used to work, Russia's broken down, EU's building up, and I can see what's going to happen. We're not farming by comparative advantage anymore. If I cloud up all this ground on top of the hill to plant wheat, barley, I might get one good crop every three years. I don't plow it up, I keep traditional grassland and I can produce a food base called protein through my sheep and my beef cattle because I can produce a higher level of protein that way than I can by plowing it up. Um, that's how I think I'm farming by comparative advantage and we make use of surplus grazing elsewhere. The argument about milk, maybe, yeah, maybe people shouldn't have milk. Maybe we ought to grow soya. Maybe we ought to grow GM soya. Maybe we ought to up production in different manners, but there's so many knock-on effects all the way around. But I think, number one, we've got to actually take on board ourselves as individuals what we need, and question yourselves on that one. Thank you, Andy. Right, we got two questions around the morning off the camera, but I'm ever so sorry. I knew there was somebody in the middle, I couldn't see him. But you have a question, there's one over there by the pillar, and then we'll call it, we'll round out of them. Thank uh, you. It's, it seems to me that a lot, a lot of it obviously comes down to the economics of what goes on. And, and, what, and what concerns me is, you know, as we continue down in this country a road of massive inequality, which, we, which has resulted in, I, I believe, a lot of the reasons we see the, the, the riots recently and things like this, the, the further inequality. And that, that obviously impacts on food. You know, if you're, if you're poor and on benefits, and it, which a, a huge amount of people are, buying food, you know, how, how will that continue? How, how are people who are very poor going to be able to continue to have access to food when we see rising um, pressures from like a growing middle class in China and India wanting food? And locally, I just want to know how you see that happening. I, I, I'm concerned about the people at the bottom. You know, I go, you know, not people who go shopping wait, wait rows. You know, big housing estates like Bar and Hill in Bristol. These places need to be fed. And how, how, farm, how can farms work that and make food, this food affordable enough for people who have very little income? Without the downfall of capitalism, obviously. All right, thank you very much. That's a good question. <laughs> who wants to take that one? Go on, John. Um, Hugely, hugely depressing issue. This really, it's, um, I mean, we're we're in the business of growing organic vegetables, which, if you ask most of the sector of society you were looking at, would view as a, you know an, an expensive middle class extravagance. Um, we aren't paying the true cost of what we eat. Nothing like it, and it's just a, a, a broken, perverse economic model that we have. You know, um, that's led us to that, and we are going to see spikes in food prices and the consequences of that are going to be unpleasant and messy. Um, gradually I think what's going to happen is the price of things will increase and for things like or, um, or organic horticulture that we're involved in buy not so much because we're less reliant on the inputs and eventually the market will, cor will, will correct itself. Now where that leaves us in terms of affordable food for the whole of society I don't have an easy answer to that, um, it's, it's probably going to, I mean, it, the, the, the only solution I can see is government is government help for farmers to try and reduce the cost of their inputs to get the price down that way. That's it. Thank you, John. And a final question from in front of the pillar. Oh, well. Oh, sorry, Michael? I can say that milk is actually cheaper than a bottle of water at the moment, <laughs> so it's good value. For the, it's the best value you can get, okay. And it has been for a long time. <laughs> Last question. Uh, I just wanted to raise a point about health. And um, it seems to me that farm kind of budget, you know, farm foods, if you're on a tight budget, it's those kind of really poor quality foods that end up being in the diet, which, of course, leads to psychological issues, ment mental issues. You know, it's all tied together. And if we want... Um, you know, a bright future with farming. We have to look to optimum health first and foremost. I mean, right now the cancer rates are just climbing, climbing. It seems like we're completely off track with healthy food to begin with. And to me, meat is not there. The protein issue. Um, I just learned recently that a baby 
uh, mother's milk. It's 1.7% is the protein in mother's milk. Well, obviously babies have got to do a lot of growing. They need protein to grow. And after that, 1.4 is the optimum percentage of protein. So there's a big myth around how much protein we actually need. And when people get cancer and they can get sorted out at this Gershon therapy place in Mexico, they put them on raw vegetables and fruit. They cut out meat, they cut out dairy, they cut out salt. So to me, that's a red flag about the meat and the dairy right there over again. So I just wanted to raise that point. Okay, a point well taken. And can I make a couple of points? Um, first of all, on, on, the, on the cost of food argument uh, uh, for people with low incomes, the, the thing they're paying for is not the food, it's the processing, and it's the profit in the supply chain. For example, a ton of spuds, I don't know what the price is now, £700 a ton, something like that, maybe. I, I don't know if anyone's got any better information. If you convert that into potato crisps, and it comes out at about around, in excess of, th- of £10,000 a ton. So there's a lot of money that's gone into the supply chain, and a lot of people on low incomes are eating snack foods because allegedly that's all they can afford. It's patent nonsense. What they need to be taught, what we all need to be taught, is to eat better food and make better better use of the food we can afford to buy. Not buying uh, snacks and crisps all the time, for instance. That was just an example. There's lots of other examples on that. The other thing I wanted to, to comment back on was about targeting the dairy industry, particularly as the source of, of Western lifestyle illnesses. Because I, I think that a lot of the problems actually are with the fats we eat. People were told in the 70s, oh, switch off butter, eat margarine. Hey, now we know margarine was loaded with trans fats, which are biologically active in the wrong sort of way. So I suspect that a lot of the problems that, that we attribute to, that the previous questioner attributed to, to, um, to milk, are in fact down to other fats in the diet and an overprocessed uh, secondary fats that are converted into yellow fats for people to eat because they look nice. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm sure that's a discussion that we're carrying yeah. on and on. Sorry? Yeah, um, uh, just on. to answer the, the breast cancer thing with milk, it, uh, it's probably to do with linding, uh, uh, the pesticide that is, uh, was widespread, I don't know if it still is. Hey, yeah. <coughs> Um, I watched a. Uh, uh, hello, is this on? Yeah. Hello, yeah. Okay, yeah. A, um, a, a Channel 4 dispatches program several years ago uh, proved that uh, breast cancer from milk was to do with linden, a pesticide that was rubbed into the, uh, the, the, the skin of the cow, the, the cow and also it's widespread in other um, farming, just chucked all over the ground. Um, many countries have banned lindane and their breast cancer rates are now falling. And um, uh, I was w- on watching that, that, that program, I chucked my, my, my pint of milk down, down the sink and I've only ever had organic milk since. Right, point taken. Thank you very much. Right, that was a really, I believe it was a really, really good session. So thank you all very much for taking part and participating so fully. What I asked Andy, how many people he's expecting to be in, a, in this sort of the, in the conference part of East or around about 50. I'm pleased to report, even 800 feet above sea level, on about 5 degrees centigrade, we've still got 60, <laughs> still got 63 people in the room. And I think that the debate that's gone on is really good. There's some, been some really big issues that have been raised that we haven't really done justice to because you'd need a you know a two-hour session on each of them just to kickstart it off. Um, but um, thank you very much for participating so fully. It really has been um, a joy to joy to share it and dead easy. I didn't have to use I didn't have to use any of my questions that I wrote down.